Mother Susan. Mother Susan. Mother Susan. Mother Susan. <laughs> Who's holding everything up? Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't try to fix it, but I did say your name in the microphone five times. <laughs> is the microphone on? Is it on? Is it? Can you hear me now? Yes. 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 That's what. Well, we're following the, the uh, book that was uh, distributed by Mother Susan. If you still want a copy, uh, you, can, you can talk to Mother Susan. She still has copies available uh, to purchase. Um, this is a chapter, chapter seven and eight of Don't, Don't Sing Songs to a Heavy Heart by Kevin Hunt. Um, it's a great book. It, it really talks a lot about how to be a caring, caring person, a caring caregiver to bring God into the equation. Uh, I'll, I'll start off with a prayer. Let us pray. Dear God, tune me into you and to the needs of the suffering one. Help me to balance on this tightrope of not too much too soon and not too little too late. Enable me to reach out with your love and be consistent in my caring as you are in caring for me. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I've given you some handouts as to what, what we're going to cover. The first chapter, the first part of chapter seven is wishing hurts away, don't you wish? Now we all wanna, as, as caregivers and as caring Christians, we all wanna, wanna go in and, and get the person from point A to point B as fast as possible. But unfortunately, you know, that's not possible, that's not realistic. As we go on as caregivers, we hurt for them, we have, we feel their pain, and we just want to fix it. We just want to fix what's going on, we want to fix what's wrong, we want to fix their pain. And unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. Um, we want them to move past it, but in reality, all we can do as caregivers is show them the path and, and, and walk with them as they start their journey of, of, of healing. Uh, sometimes, it, 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 in our nature, as I said, as Christians, it kind of it, we get everything kind of gets in the way when we try to fix things. Unfortunately, uh, some of the goals that you might might want them to achieve get better. Accept his or her situation. See the hopeful side of the situation. Make healthy choices. Maintain good relations with family and friends. Feel close to God. Develop stronger faith. Inspire others by his or her Christian response to pain and suffering. Everybody deals with loss and suffering and pain differently. Everybody goes at their own pace. We can't map out a path for them. We have to be there to be the caring caregiver, to be the person who cares, brings God close to them. Well, it, these are great goals, and I think we'll all agree those are, those are wonderful goals. The one who is suffering almost can, can never really achieve them when it's you that are mapping out their, their journey, when you are mapping out their path when you are trying so hard to fix their pain and to take it away. Allowing, knowing that they are not alone, being present, praying with them, and, and just walking with them at their own pace is the best thing that you can do. The role of fixer, of course, <coughs> is God. It's not your role. It, it's very freeing to be able to let God do the healing. Um, as Stephen ministers, we're trained to spend time with, with the person who is in pain and um, who is suffering, and not to look at goal-oriented, you know, you know goal-oriented, you know, the process is goal-oriented. We want to look at the process 
We want to deal with the process, not the goals. That's our role as a caregiver, to help them with the process. You want the, you you can't give them the specific goals that you want want to achieve because they're not their goals. You want them to embrace the process, no matter how long it will take. When I was speaking with Dean Peterson last week after church, and we talked about fixing things, and we don't want to fix things, he pointed out that I'm in a very unique situation. When I lost my leg 13 years ago, I went to the, I went to the prosthetist, I got casted for a socket, which is the hard thing that, that holds my holds my, my prosthesis in place. Um, he got, he, I went to PT, I started walking, I learned to adapt, and I learned to do things differently. But I learned to do things that were unable, I was unable to do before. For all intents and purposes, I was fixed. It didn't replace the limb that I'd lost, but it was, a, it was, and I know a lot of amputees who will agree, it was a great replacement part, and it served me well. I've been able to get back to sports, I've been able to get back to taking care of my family, being strong for them. And so for all intents and purposes, that was, that was the physical loss, and that was something you, we can fix. A broke, broke down, broken down car, you can get it repaired. Even if a car is totaled, you can replace it. House burns down, you can rebuild. But we can't fix emotional loss, emotional suffering. We can't fix those things that, that we can't see. And sometimes you can see the pain on their face. Sometimes you can, you can look at them, that they're suffering, they're weeping, they're venting, they're angry, they're, they're sad, they're, hope, they're feeling hopeless. Um, Kenneth Hall tells us to fix things, not people. Trying to fix people is not an appropriate or even an attainable goal. As far as when my husband died, that was an emotional loss. And that was something that couldn't be fixed. It couldn't, the pain couldn't be repaired. It couldn't be reversed. And that was a whole different concept, a whole different path that I was traveling down. After my, my um, amputation surgery, I was in Legwood, and Father Bob came to visit me. He didn't come with solutions. He didn't come with a, 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 a map or a mysterious puzzle to, to, uh, to, to look at and to, uh, and, to, and, to look, and to work on and to fix. He came there to pray with me. He came there to listen. He held my hand. He brought God close to my side. And up to that point, I, I was always a person of faith. I was always close to God, I thought. But when, when my husband died, I was angry at God. And he couldn't fix that. I couldn't fix that alone. I wish I'd had a Stephen minister, because a Stephen minister would have been able to walk with me, listen to me, and not give me solutions, because there, there weren't any solutions. It couldn't be, I, I couldn't take, the, the pain couldn't be taken away from me. But a Stephen minister could have been there with me to, to hold my hand, let me cry if I wanted to. And so that's, that's something I really miss. When I came back to Christ Church, uh, I, I didn't have people who said to me, uh, let's, let, let's help you on your journey of grief by giving you solutions. Uh, Father Bob encouraged me to get back to church to begin the healing process, and that's what I did. When I came back to church, I found a, a wonderful community of faith. I found a, a wonderful community of family that embraced me, didn't offer me solutions, but gave me hope that I wasn't carrying this load alone this heavy load that I was carrying, God, God can take away my heavy load. They couldn't take my heavy load, but they could give me hope that my load would be shared. It would be lifted off me, and it would be something that maybe it's, it, at some point I could manage. I learned 
you can't move on from the loss. I think you just have to make space in your life for it. And I think that's something I learned. And I think I learned that from coming to Christ Church. And, and my relationship with God grew stronger. My faith grew stronger. And I think that's something I learned. And that's something that, that Father Bob encouraged me to, to learn. But he didn't give me the answers. He didn't say, this is what you're going to learn. This is what you're going to find out. This is who you're going to find at church. He just said, come back to church and begin the healing process. And that's what I did. The, uh, when, I, when I found such love and acceptance here, I, 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 never, I never felt that people were pushing me in one direction or another, pushing me down one path or another path. I really felt that I, I could learn to, to deal with my pain and I was with a family that could help carry the load for me. And as I said, just making space in your life for it is healing in and of itself. And as time has gone on, that space has, has grown. It hasn't shrunk. I'll never stop grieving. But in that case, it's my, that space is, is separate. My heart is full of love for my children, my grandchildren, my great-grandchildren. My heart is full of love for all of you. And I really want to really thank you all for being there. When I, when I came back to Christ Church 13 years ago, I really want to thank all of you for being there for me. Kenneth Hope tells us that as a caregiver, you don't need an agenda. The best thing you can do is not to have an agenda. And you, you won't always be able to rate, relate to the person in pain. You won't always be able to feel comfortable when somebody is crying or in so much pain. You may not be able to relate to that. You may not feel comfortable with that because you want, you want to take it away. You don't want them to be suffering and in pain. But, that, but the thing is that, that that's God's terrain to do the healing. You can't do the healing. You are the caregiver. God is the cure giver. And we learned that in Stephen ministry training. Thank you, Mother Susan. <laughs> um, don't expect that you'll be able to, to miraculously take away the pain. That you'll, you'll miraculously find some magic solution. Uh, it just doesn't happen. It's not attainable. Um, walking with that person, sharing, and being Christ's love and compassion, when you do that, you'll be making a significant difference in the suffering person's life. Moving on to the next one, uh, the next section. Um, the, the last thing, the last thing the, um, about the, after the agendas is hitting home run. You're not there to hit a home run. Hey, Jeff. You're not there to hit a home run. You're there to help them get from base to base. You're not there to push them along, you're there to be there for them, you're there to be present. As I said, you are there as God's representative. You are bringing God into the equation, you are bringing God to their side, just as Father Bob brought God to my side, and that brought me great comfort. And I think that's, that's the takeaway, you can bring great comfort to the person who is suffering. But the healing, that's God's job. Are there any questions at this point before we move on to chapter 8? Comment? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I guess you, don't, you, you wouldn't want to go to an auction, of course. <laughs> Posey. Yes. Um, you've been a tremendous example to all of us here at Christ Church. Um, Skydiving, out of planes, water skiing, playing tennis. Um, it's just uh, skiing on snow. Um, can you just tell us a little bit about after the bombing, um, how you ministered to the amputees as a result of that horrific event? Yes, thank you. Jane, Jane just said, uh, you've been a wonderful inspiration to all of us with what you've done since your amputation. 
time you skydive, you water ski, you surf, you go up, you play tennis, um, you, you ski on snow. And she asked if I could speak a little bit about when I was ministering to the marathon survivors, the Boston Marathon bombing survivors, back in 2013 when that horrific event occurred. Back then, I didn't know at that time what God would be calling me to do. I don't think any of us know at, at any point until we're hit between the, right between the eyes. When I was called to go in and, and spend some time with them, to visit them, I didn't know if I'd have the right words to say. I didn't know if I could cheer them up. I could relate to them. But I, I didn't know if I'd have the right words for them because I had lost my leg to an infection. It hadn't been a bombing. It hadn't been something horrific. It was a bombing. How could I minister to them in that in those tragic circumstances. So when I went in, uh, God gave me the words, as he always does. And I knew what I'd been called to do. And I spent a lot of time with them. I still spend time with them. I skied with one of the survivors yesterday. And he's just, he's just, he, he's just done so well. And he's really moved, moved from a place of anger and hate and, and, and just, frustration uh, to a place where he can move on with his life, never forgetting what happened. So I found that if I had never lost my leg, I never would have been able to, to minister to these people. It had really been a gift from God, it had been by God's grace that I had lost my leg, to be able to be called to a different service. And I didn't know all the years before I came back to Christ Church, I didn't know what my calling would be, how I would be called to serve God. And at that moment, I found that that was my calling. And when I did, I spent time with them. We talked, we laughed. It sounds strange, but we laughed. And we cried. And since that time, many of the marathon survivors have started foundations to donate prosthetics to people who've lost legs to trauma. And then there are other organizations that donate legs to people who, who haven't lost the trauma but just need another prosthesis to get, get around, a better one, a running blade, for example, to be able to run. So I, I feel like I've played a part in their recovery, but it, it wasn't me. It was God. It was God working through me. And that's the important thing to remember as a caregiver. You're there. God is working through you. And that's what I found out. That's what I learned. And I was humbled by the, the calling that I would be called to do something so special. And I realized that my life had far more meaning than just getting back to sports. My, my life had so much more meaning than just living everyday life. I started a support group for amputees in the fall after I lost my leg. And it brought other amputees together there's something is like AA. There's nothing like another person who's been down that path to console and comfort somebody who's been in a similar situation. And that's where, where I found myself with the Boston Marathon survivors. Mm -hmm. They talked about it. They were, many of them were, obvious. they were very angry at the terrorists. And some of them, when I spent some time with one of them that I skied with yesterday, initially, I was biking with him back in 2013 right after the bombing, and he said, he's, I said, somebody came up to us and saw that we were amputees, he lost his leg below the knee. Somebody came up to us and said, oh, were you in the marathon bombing? I said, no, I wasn't. I didn't even know that Steve had. And Steve said, yes, I was. And he didn't really want to talk about it. So we, we started biking, and, and he said, let's talk about it a little bit. So we talked about it. And I said, are you, are you angry at God? He said, very much so. And I spent a lot of time with him. I encouraged him to come to my support group. He came to my support group. And initially I kind of ran defense for him. And when we go around the table and tell people a little bit about their story, I kind of ran defense and said, said you don't have to talk if you don't want to. And, and I said to Steve ahead of time, I said, 
just tell them whatever you feel comfortable telling them. And he said, I lost my leg to trauma. And that was the extent of it. And he came to the, he came to the support group in the, I started in September in, of 2011. In 2013, in April with the bombing, I biked with him in May. And then in September, he came to my support group. So it hadn't been that long since the bombing. So I, I told him, just speak when you're, you feel comfortable, talk when you feel comfortable, share when you feel comfortable. And then in February, he said, I think I'd like to talk about it. And he did share with the group. And he talked about his experience. And he talked, he didn't talk about his anger with God, because I think he was, he was coping with that. I think he'd seen so many caring people that surrounded him and the others that 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 anger just turned to the terrorists not to god because it wasn't god's fault and i think he came to realize that i think that's true for all of us that something happens some loss some tragedy you know starvation bombing war we think oh where is god all that time and the thing it's not god that causes any of this it's not god that calls causes chaos. And when Steve came to the meeting and he shared, people asked questions and he was very comfortable sharing. He shared as much as he felt comfortable doing. And that was that was that was where he felt comfortable. And when he felt comfortable enough that he didn't need the support group, he went on and started he went back to skiing. He got a special ski prosthesis so he could flip into the ski. And he took his instructor, his adaptive instructor uh, certification class course and test and passed it. And so I ski with him quite frequently and he's just awesome. And the other the story about Steve is when he when he was at, at the bombing, he was at the forum where the second bomb went off. And when the second bomb went off, it, it destroyed his ankle. He had his little son, Leo, with him in a stroller, number four. And Leo had a big gash on his head from shrapnel. So Steve passed him off to the to a Boston police officer and said, take care of my son. Then he lay down and he took his belt off and put a tourniquet around his thigh. Man came up to him and said, I'm an orthopedic surgeon from Texas. You're gonna thank me someday. He put the tourniquet, put another one below his knee, took off the one above his knee, saved his knee, which is huge for an amputee. And so when people say we was God that day, God was everywhere he needed to be. He was there in that orthopedic surgeon. And he, he was there in the people that, that counseled him and, and consoled him and, and comforted him during the days and the years later. So that's, that's a little bit about my experience with the marathon survivors. I spent a lot of time with Heather Rabbit, who's the has a foundation, and I spent a lot of time. I did a photo shoot with her back when she wanted to start her foundation, and so I've I've been very involved with them. I do a lot of sports for them. We're a very unique community, and so it's it's nice to share and be be together with other amputees. So that that's really that's really my experience with the with the marathon survivors. Anybody else any, have any questions or? Okay, let's move on. Jeff, oh, go ahead, Audrey. I just want to know if I don't want to talk too much because I will find out. But I will just say that my son had this terrible trauma in the left rotator disc, um, a gash in the left rotator liver that he needs to take. My mother is with early diagnosis. Um, whatever it is, I think I natural initial response is to scream. Thank you.
thank you, our reset, she was talking about people who have loss and are grieving. Uh, the, the, the road is not always linear. The road is not always something where they, they stay angry at God. Sometimes they do for extended periods of time, for years. They, ne they never get over it. But Audrey points out that, that everybody goes at their own pace. Everybody goes at the, at the pace they feel comfortable with and they, they feel drawn to. It may not always be a healthy path, but they always feel that they've been drawn, what path they've been drawn to. And, and the important thing, as Audrey points out, is that, that to em embrace the process and to realize that anger isn't something that people just get over, get over, and, they, and but they can move on if they can get past that anger and get to a different space. Is that paraphrasing it correctly? Stop being angry at God. Right, absolutely. And some people, like you said, ne never get to that point. And Elizabeth Kubler-Ross talks about all the stages of grief. And and in the stages of grief, acceptance is the last one. Anger is way up there. And, and an acceptance is way down there. And it takes sometimes that, that, that journey from way up there in anger and denial and bargaining. It, it, it takes a long, long time to get to, except some people never get there. I know lots of amputees who stayed angry, not just at God, but just angry at their situation. Angry, at, they didn't take care of themselves. They were a diabetic. They didn't take care of their feet. They didn't take care of open wounds in their legs or in their feet. And they lost a limb because of it. And, it, and they may be a wheelchair user now. They may not be able to get out of the house. They're angry that they didn't take care of themselves. They're angry that, that, that this happened to them. So they may never get to acceptance. And I know a lot of people who don't. Susan. So that's our role, right? To um, show God's love and to them. Uh, and that's so they can start to be less angry. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Mother Susan points. Oh, go ahead. Mother Susan points out that that's our role as caregivers to bring God's love to them to help them deal with the anger and sort it out and, and get past that. And that's our role as caregivers. And as I pointed out before, God is a caregiver. God's the one that heals. But we bring that healing process to the relationship. We bring God into the relationship. And, and that's our role as, as caregivers. Thank you. Yes, Bruce. Uh, actually, Bill. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. sorry. <laughs> so whether those to whom you're ministering are people of faith or not of faith, their, their anger initially is likely to crowd out an awful lot of other emotions. And I realize that you are presenting yourself as an, uh, an instrument or a vessel of God's love. But for many people, they're skeptical that God could be with them in the foxhole, could be with them in this, through this suffering, whether people of faith or not you, other than through your own love, how do you present the reality that God is Emmanuel with us, with them? Thank you, Bill. Uh, Bill's question is, um, when people aren't people of faith, there are people of faith, people are, are not of faith, and when you're ministering to them, how do we keep, how do we present to them the concept that God is with them? He's in them, in the foxhole with them. That, that is God, bringing God's love, is that going to be something that resonates with them or they, is that gonna get through to them? And how do we minister to them? And as caregivers, that's exactly what we do. We show God's love. 
we, we show God's love to the caregiver and that hopefully transmits to them and shows them that God is, uh, is a caring, caring being, that God is loving, God is caring. And even in the deepest, deepest pain, sometimes just being there, being present and knowing, knowing that you are a person of faith, knowing that you are a person who, who is bringing God into the equation, who is bringing God into the relationship, that's, that's the role of the caregiver. And that's sometimes, and oftentimes, the best you can do and the most you can do and is oftentimes the way that you can convey to them that you are God's love and you are bringing God's love to them. They don't always accept it. In Steve's case, he was not a person of faith. He used to be. His parents were very devout Christians. And in, in time, after a few years, um, he texted me and said, my mom has cancer. Will you pray for her? And he was not a person of faith. So I think, I think it's not osmosis, but I think just being present, bringing God's love into the relationship is the way we as caregivers can help them find God in their lives if they've lost it or if they never had it. And I think helping them to find it, showing them, not showing them, mapping out a way giving them solutions, but, but helping them on their journey of grief, helping them, listening, holding their hand, hugging, or if, if appropriate, all of those things can bring God into the equation. Yes. Um, the question or the comment was, uh, I, she thinks that, that bringing, bringing, being there for them, uh, whether they're a person of faith or not, um, is something that, that as, as not as the cure giver, because God's the cure giver, as a caregiver, just being there and seeing that the person is a person of faith in, in, our, in, in us as caregivers, seeing us as a person of faith, seeing us as agents of God, representing God, bringing God into the relationship, is oftentimes the, the most helpful that, that we can be, is oftentimes something that they will grab onto, maybe not right away, but will grab onto. So thank you for that comment, that was great. Any other, yes? I can just add a comment to what you were saying about the marathon bombing. And I have a daughter-in-law who was a victim. She was near nearing the end of her run when the marathon bomb went off, and it got her in her leg. And she uh, was put by the by the bombing under the barrier of the actual path of the runners, and she was left on the side of the road. And, but, and not seen by the first responders. They never, she wasn't picked up. And fortunately, a bystander watching the marathon, a, and she was a nurse, um, saw my daughter-in-law lying there and ran to somebody and said, the, poli the police, uh, she hasn't been picked up. So a policeman got to her, got her into a car, took her right to the Boston Medical Center, and I, she was, has, uh, they were probably the best place to go because they knew how to work, the surgeons knew how to work on this kind of situation. And I think my son and daughter-in-law now say, how you know how you say, thank God. They were actually thanking God for that nurse 
who saved her and she's a hundred percent fine. More than her. Next to an excellent person at the Boston Medical Center. So that was not an anger, but instead it was a thank you. And I don't know if they were looking up in the heavens and saying thank you God, but they were actually thanking God. Wonderful. Comment was that uh, her daughter-in-law was in the marathon bombing, and she was lying there. And she was from the blast. She was moved, pushed over underneath the barrier, so people didn't see her. And finally, she was lying there. She didn't think anybody could see her. And a bystander came over, and he got a police officer who then made sure she got into a car, got to the Boston Medical Center where the surgeon there uh, treated her, and now she's fine. But when she was there, and her and her this, this woman's son was there, I'm sorry, I don't know your name. Her son got the message on his cell phone, so he wasn't there at the time. He got to the hospital after she was admitted, but eventually they let him in, but it took time. They both, looked up to heaven and said, thank you, God. They weren't angry. Thank you, God, for the, for the, for the passerby, for the, the bystander. Thank you, God, for the police officer. Thank you, God, for the surgeon for Boston Medical Center. Now, thanks be to God for, for all the blessings he gives us. And, and so it isn't always about anger. And in my case, thanks be to God that, that I survived and I've been able to minister to the, those who are in pain and, in, and suffering. So thank you for that. Let's move on to chapter 8, for better or for worse. Caring is action, not just good intentions. Express, when you express your good, good intentions through loving and appropriate deeds, uh, when done effectively, you can bring hope and encouragement to the sufferer. When not done effectively, they may not be everything you want them to be. Some guidelines for six caring actions that can serve as a guide to help you care more effectively are sending cards and notes, making phone calls, asking questions, using humor, sparingly, <laughs> sharing reading materials, assuring people of God's love. Sending a card is always welcome, and you can get a blank card and write a, a sentence or two, or just a, a few, few sentences, letting them know that you're thinking of them. Um, it's not the time to, uh, to sprinkle in your family events, you know, you get, oh, guess what's happening in my family? So-and-so got accepted into college. You know, that's not the time for you to share your events. It's not about you. Is about the about the hurting person. Right from your heart, not not from your not from your uh, from your head. Sprinkle in your you. I'm so this question, uh, comments like uh, I'm so sorry to hear about your or you've been on my mind a lot lately or our hearts go out to you. I know you're hurting and I wish I could be there. Or my heart broke when I heard that. Or we're deeply saddened by the news that. I received a note at one point when I was, uh, when I was uh, ill. I think, I, I think I've been ill a lot. Um, I think it was a couple of years ago. And I got this note from Jan Colbert, our very own Jan Colbert. And it, and it basically says, well, my intrepid friend, you do a zillion things a day that would scare most people. But even so, I'm sorry you're going through a tough time now. You're an amazing woman and greatly loved and admired. And the verse that she, she put with this, even the saddest things can become, once we have made peace with them, a source of wisdom and strength by Frederick Buchner Putnam. And that's, that's the kind of note that touches the heart it really brings you comfort, and that's who Jan is. 
We love you, Jan. Making phone calls. You have to be really, really careful about making phone calls if you're really close to them. It's a little easier. But when you don't know them that well, you're just starting your caring relationship. Sometimes it's, you know, you need backing off is better. A note is better than a phone call. If you do make a phone call, keep it short. Again, don't bring in your family events, and your family news, uh, or or so and so had a, had cancer and he got through it, and he. So you you know you'll get through it. You'll be all right. More platitudes, which we don't, they don't need, and we should certainly should not not be spouting platitudes. We've talked about that the last three weeks. Um, excuse me. Yes. Yeah. Yes, uh, Mother Susan commented that uh, the way we handle it these days, uh, a good way to handle it is to text before you call and ask the person when is a good time to talk. And they may not feel like talking, but that, that gives them an out. That gives them the opportunity to say, not right now. I don't feel like talking right now. They can, they can feel overwhelmed. And, and oftentimes they are overwhelmed depending on the circumstances, depending on what's causing their suffering and their pain. Gauge the time to call. Don't try not to call them during nap time. But if you do, you know, or with friends or family, you're most likely to be visiting or meal time. And as Mother Susan points out, if you text them ahead of time, then they you take the cues from them. Then you you take your cues and you call them, keep it brief, let them talk. Don't you do all the talking. It's, you're there for them. You know, they're not there for you. They're not there to console you because, because you're, you're trying to fix their pain, take away their pain, um, in, in, you know, insist that God is there. You can't do that. That's, that's a platitude because God is there. But it's not up to you to, to force that on them and to, and to tell them that that's the way it is. That's for them to figure out and to, and to find out. When my husband died, I was in shock, of course, because it was a sudden death, and I didn't want to talk to anybody. I was numb in, in grief. My kids, my kids were there. I don't even remember the wake. I don't even remember the wake. And when we got home, that I stayed with my son for a little while, and strangely enough, I didn't want to look at picture albums or look at notes from him from the past, cards or notes from him. I wanted to watch movies, and I don't know why, but I wanted to watch movies. So I took out my iPad and started watching movies. It had nothing to do with grief, and I couldn't, I couldn't understand later why I did that. And I think it was denial, which is true in the stages of grief. I think it was denial, but it was also a distraction from just talking about it and thinking about it. The kids wanted to keep him alive um, the whole time and talk about things that, w that he did when they, when they, that they remembered about their dad. They wanted to keep him alive and, and I did too, but I really wanted to be alone. I really, I really was numb. I really was feeling, feeling overwhelmed and I just needed some alone time. And I didn't want to talk on the phone as I said. I didn't want to visit with people. I just wanted to be alone. And the kids were wonderful, as I said. Stayed with my son, and we had meals. We we did talk and so forth. But I, I also knew I could go up to my room and, and watch a movie. And then I then I chose I chose a movie. Um, uh, I'm trying to think of what the name of it is. Um, I, I can't remember. But, then, but I, I chose a movie where a man had a dog, and, it was, and they were so close. He used to he used to come. The dogs used to come to the train station every day that he left for work, and he'd go go back and forth. And the dog was there when he got home, off the train, greeting him, and he he took, he, he was a constant companion. This was a professor. He brought him to classes, and 
this this dog was was loved by this man. Well, the man died, and the dog didn't know what to do with himself. He, this is somebody that he loved dearly. He waited for him every day at the train, and he saw him off on the train. So he would feel in the grief. So it's not just humans that feel grief. It's, it's animals that feel grief, too. Any, every living being feels grief in a different way, of course. But every human being feels grief. And that was a movie I chose. So the man died, so I'm like, ugh. <laughs> that was a bad movie to pick. <laughs> but, <laughs> anyway. uh, but one of the first things I did when I came back to church, just to go back a little bit, I attended an alpha course, uh, alpha training at, uh, at an Essex retreat. And I was, I had just gotten to know some of the, some of my fellow parishioners. I didn't know them very well, but I was there and we prayed together. We, we talked, we did a lot, we prayed a lot, we talked a lot. And I felt, felt their warmth. I felt their caring. I felt their love, even though I didn't, didn't know them very well. But again, nobody, nobody came in to offer me a, a solution and, and offer ways to get over my grief. It was just there. And that meant so much to me. And then later in 2013 or 2012, Mother Susan came to our church and she and Father Patrick and Karen Mason um, and Carolyn uh, O'Donnell uh, started a, the, the uh, Stephen Minister training. And I was in that first class and I learned how to pray out loud, which takes a lot of practice. If you've ever tried to pray out loud, it, sometimes you stumble over the words, and, but it takes some practice. We did role playing where we, 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 one person would be the, the caregiver, one person would be the, the suffering person, and we practiced what we were supposed to say, what, what we should say, what we shouldn't say, uh, what's, what's taboo, what puts us into dangerous territory. And I learned so much from that. And at that time I wasn't driving, and because I just, I, I wasn't driving before my husband died because I had low blood pressure and I was passing out the wheel. So the doctor said, I'd rather you don't drive. <laughs> and so I gave up my license. So I was taking a ride and I got rides to church for, for, the, uh, for the Stephen Ministry training. And while I was there, my daughter, uh, my sister took me out for a drive. She said, let's, let's drive around the parking lot. And she said, you haven't lost it. Go for your license again. So I went to the registry and I got my license again. And when I, when I was at, at, at the Stephen Ministry training, I was all excited. I was getting my license again. And then my daughter took me to a, a, a deep car dealership and there was a cute little Kia Soul there. And so my daughter and I finagled and, and we made a deal. I hopped in the car and first song, I turned on the radio, the first song that played was Stairway to Heaven. <laughs> yes, I'm sorry. Um, just to reiterate, um, letting the um, the person take the lead. Uh, when I was in the movie Mentored Students Minister, and some of you have heard the story. Um, it was 2020, and I got a care receiver, and everybody was in lockdown, so I had to talk to her on the phone and call, cold call her, basically. She didn't know me. I didn't know her, and I had all my prayer books on my desk. I had, you know, St. Francis prayer book. I had Book of Common Prayer. I had everything. <laughs> I was wet, and, and so I um, talked to her, and I said, you know, we'd like to pray, and she was like, pray on the phone? 
back and he talked a little bit about prayer and religion and how that worked in our lives and different challenges we had. But I just tell the story to reiterate that, you know, you have to sort of let the person um, lead you along the path and sometimes what you think they want is, is really not. Thank you, Leslie. What Leslie is saying, she was a newly minted Stephen minister, and she was assigned a care uh, care uh, uh, a um, care, receiver. care receiver. Thank you, a care receiver. And it was during COVID. It was 2020, and she couldn't visit in person, so she had to visit over the phone. And that was awkward because she didn't know them. They didn't know her. She didn't know where they were in their faith journey. So they talk, they talked about they talked about sports, they talked about politics, they talked about everything but faith. And that was okay. And what Leslie is pointing out, that there are different ways to approach it, that not every no no one size fits all. And it's important to take the lead from the care receiver. And when she was ready to talk about her situation, then she was able to open up and, and share more. But you take your lead, but take your cues from the care receiver. Thank you, Leslie. Asking questions. When you're visiting, ask open-ended questions. Like, not, are you angry? How are you, you know, are you, how are you feeling is better? Can you tell me a little bit more about that? And are you, are you overwhelmed? That's not an open-ended question. So ask ask questions that how, how, are you you know can you tell me more about how you're feeling overwhelmed when they mention they're overwhelmed using humor as i said sparingly you have to know the right time if you know the person it's much easier but when you use humor use it sparingly take your lead from the person and don't overdo it don't jump on the van bandwagon with friends or family and say and carry it on further than it needs to go. As an amputee, there are so many amputee jokes, and I love to tell them. <laughs> I was surfing once, and there was a fellow, Mike Bennington, who's a, who's a upper arm amputee, and he, it was his first time surfing. So he came surfing, and he went out there, and he tried it, and he, and he came back, and he said, I think I'm getting the hang of it. I said, I'm gonna hand it to you, Mike. <laughs> Sharing reading materials. Sometimes reading materials can be very helpful. Um, when I was when I first was named, yeah, I couldn't get my hands on enough books, magazines, articles about being an amputee. And a person with cancer always wants to know more. They don't want to be in denial. They want to know more. They want to know what the what what the procedures are, what the options are, what the chances are, uh, what what the what the options are. So. Uh, Make sure it's a book that, that you've read, that you're familiar with, before you recommend a book. And uh, when, I, when I was first grieving, I picked up a book by C.S. Lewis, Observing Grief, a Grief Observed, sorry, by C.S. Lewis. And that was very helpful because he had been down that journey of loss. He'd lost his wife. And that's kind of came around to connect him with God in a much more meaningful way. It formed so much of his views on loss and relationship with God. Assuring people of God's love. As Christians, this may sound like an odd action to suggest. How can, how can sharing God's love ever be out of place? But it is important to carefully think about when, how, and why you're sharing it. Make, sharing such assurances isn't something that is your role. It's more helpful to ask the person how they're feeling and thinking, and something is, could you say more about that? Let the person talk about their feelings. Let them, let them talk about the relationship with God if they even want to. They may not even want to. So it's not you're not there to assure them of God's love. You're there to demonstrate it. And the important thing is when you bring bring a caring as a care receiver, if you're bringing 
tearing into a, the relationship. You're the symbol of God's love. There's no magic formula. And, and uh, resist the urge to offer ways that will fix the situation, just to summarize. Um, or tell them how to map out the grieving process. As a caregiver, we shouldn't be goal-oriented, but process-oriented, and there's no magic formula for how long that grief will last or how long that journey will last. It's different for everybody, like Leslie pointed out. There's no, there's no set formula. One size does not fit all. There are several ways to aid you in your caring process, sending cards, notes, making phone calls, visiting, sharing reading material, humor uh, are all ways. Remember, your presence and the expressions of caring are by far the best way of assuring them of God's love. Any questions or comments? We have just a couple minutes left. Yes, Becky. Thank you, Becky. Uh, Becky's comment is, when you're, when you're working with somebody of little faith or no faith, uh, or their faith is all over the place, they may not even know about God's unconditional love, because that's a concept that's so hard to, to accept for everybody. Unconditional love? How could any being provide unconditional love? So Becky's point is, just by being there, you're bringing unconditional love, God's unconditional love, into the relationship. Thank you. Any other? Yes, Meg. Just, it might be covered in the book, but I just wanted to share something that's like super, can be super helpful for some people who are going through like the loss of a child or, you know, somebody in the family has died. And our, we had dear friends out in Minnesota whose son at age 22 suddenly passed away. Our daughter and husband were the godparents to that child. And so they checked first, but they ended up flying out there and just being in the house so that as everybody from the church is dropping off food and wanting to comfort the family, they, my daughter and her husband, were at the door taking food, organizing it, and sort of being the buffer from the too much love that was coming in. I mean, it was wonderful love, but they, they just needed somebody there to do the physical things of like line casseroles up on in the fridge and and <coughs> receive the flowers and put them in vases for the, fam the family to just sit on the couch and cry. That's friends. a great point, Meg. She brings up the point of somebody perhaps losing a child um, or any, time, any kind of loss. When when um, somebody is, 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 is suffered a loss, Sometimes the best thing you can do, the most thing they need is to organize things, to put things away, to put casseroles out, to be the one to put the flowers in vases, 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 <laughs> vases. Uh, and so the, sometimes the best thing you can do is do physical things, organize them, the, 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 the casseroles, organize the, the flowers, put them out if they want do them. The do the dishes. Absolutely do the dishes. Make coffee. <laughs> I know all about making coffee. <laughs>
Well, that, that, our time is up. Thank you. Thank you so very much.